you are now doing luxury self-storage. What is that? These are like heated units. They got two lights in them. They got a, a one outlet and yeah. they're 20 by 50. That's a huge storage. As housing gets more and more unaffordable, you get less and less square footage on your lot. Yeah. Everyone dies for a thousand square foot space for 500 bucks. This is unique. No one has it. So like you're, you're basically never going to have competition. <laughs> Everyone in North Dakota thinks they have to do everything. Yeah. Or in some markets, you have to do everything. You don't. Um, and, and in most cases, real estate is not a passive investment. Yeah. It's constant attention. But there's ways to get all the benefits of real estate and be a passive investor. Welcome to another episode of the Wealthy Way Podcast, where my mission is to help you not go broke trying to get rich. Today, I got one of my favorite people. This guy, I think, showed up in an event like six months ago. Now he's a wealthy creator and all these amazing things. And I'm watching him grow his brand um, tremendously. But what he's doing just in his normal business life before social media is very impressive. He's got a construction business doing over $25 million a year. He's got um, all these properties that he already owns over $15 million worth. And he's doing a niche of real estate that very few talk about, which are not just any storage unit, but luxury storage units. Yeah, got man. Mark Coon. <laughs> what up? Hey, appreciate you, Ryan. I am ecstatic to be here because I didn't think I would actually get to be on here. But we get to work together. I know. You got to te me, teach me the social media game, which I kind of failed in 22. So I'm taking 23 as my leaps and bounds. Yeah. I mean, you're already making a lot of progress just watching the content. Yeah. You're doing good. So you are from North Dakota, which I've spent a lot of time with, you know, when I was playing um, for the Fargo Moorhead Redhawks. And that's how we first connected. Yeah. Like, how are you doing real estate in North Dakota? Nobody lives out there. <laughs> It's actually a weird statistic, but we're like one of the faster growing states right now. But again, when you add a thousand to a low population, <laughs> the percentage, is the, very percent high. the percentage says high. Um, but you know, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Boise, like you know, Idaho, they're all they're quickly growing um, because they're all investor friendly states. Yeah, like who's moving there? Is it like empty nesters or what? Yeah, you know what? People just it's the lifestyle. It's very simple to go anywhere. It's very, you know, you can put your kids in a school, not worry about, you know, yeah. there's no shootings like that. Nah, you know, there's just none of that going on there. It's very, it's very boring place to live. Yeah. Um, but it's a very healthy place to raise a family. So yeah. I think, I think that that's what you see. And there's a lot of entrepreneurs out yeah. in Fargo. I know you spent some time there. Yeah. I don't know if you Back met then others. I wasn't really like the entrepreneur I am today. I was still like just the baseball guy trying to focus on baseball. So I didn't see things from the lens that I see it today. Yeah. But I mean, Fargo is like a big city. I mean, it's a college town. They got teams, they got businesses like, but you're in um, Grand Forks, right? Yeah. So I'm an we, hour north. Yeah. That is not Fargo. That's much smaller. <laughs> yeah. So my graduating class was like 38, you know, from, I'm from Thompson, which is just a little south of Grand Forks. We'll call it a suburb. Um, yeah. And uh, there's a thousand people in the town, um, it's but it's where I grew up. Uh, I rebuilt the house that I grew, grew up in there. Yep. And uh, you know what? Thompson has just been a safe place for my family and, and where to grow up. It's not in a big town. And as I grew my construction company, I kind of grew out of the town. Yeah. So there isn't enough pop. There's just not enough going on. Yeah. You're limited. Yeah. And of course, as entrepreneurs, we don't want to be limited. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you, you grew this construction company to, to be pretty massive. Like probably, are you the biggest construction company in Grand Forks? Um, one, one of them. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's probably four of us that are that compete are just, for work. Got it. Okay. And you are now doing luxury self storage. What is that? Yeah, man. So <clears throat> basically I've been a contractor. I were limited by the amount of work that was happening in our market. So the development side of me decided that, Hey, we got to figure out a development something that we can keep busy and do some more work. Be, keep Basically the create work for your construction. I have company. to. Yeah. You figure it out, man. So it's like, I had to make something work. So it's like, you know what? Luxury storage. And I, and I kind of named it that I've never heard anyone else call that. And, uh, it works in, I would say even better in populated areas, but in North Dakota, it's cold. Wow. <laughs> Just, uh, and, and with it being cold, these are like heated units. They got two lights in them. They got a, a one outlet and yeah. they're 20 by 50. Simple unit. 20 by 50? Yep. That's a huge storage. Yeah. So the key about those storage units are you can call them storage, not contractor shops. Because 
they insure much differently, okay. a quarter of the price. And then storage the, is a quarter of the price. Yeah, storage. So wait, is do much people cheaper. work out of there? Well, who knows? I've right? seen porter potties, and I've yeah. seen some debatable stuff going on. But you know, okay, <laughs> a little blind by that. Yeah, but people rent these because they're half the price of, say, a contractor shop. That would be twenty by fifty. That's a thousand square feet. Yeah, and 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 there, I can charge half the price. I can adapt to the people, like say a guy like you. You got a bunch of stuff, right? right? You need space. Well, in a big town, even like Vegas. Real estate's expensive. The land. Yeah. Right? Like, you can, you're not just putting up a big shop. Yeah. You gotta just, buy the land. The land's a huge cost. Yeah. So, where these storage units also work is by highly dense, you know, populations, dense, like, market areas, housing markets, because people can't just build an exterior building. Right. In North Dakota, we can do that. And I know if they're working there, I know they would work even in this market. Right. Because you can just rent for 500 bucks a month, rent a big garage stall up. That's what you rent those for? Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, we get... 700 bucks. So, I mean, when I was flipping couches, okay, so this was eight years ago, nine years ago, ten, man, maybe 10 years ago now. <laughs> come out of retirement. It's, it's been a, yeah, I am going to come out of retirement with those kinds of deals. <laughs> so I remember like looking through the storage <laughs> units and like, you know, there, this was a nice storage unit I was at and we had, um, you know, you had like a traditional five by five, then like a five by eight. And those were all like interior. You got to walk to them and there's no drive up or anything. Right. I'm right. like, this ain't going to work for couch flipping. Like what else you got? They're like, all right, we got these 10 by thirties. And that was the biggest they had. So it's just like a single garage, 10 by 30. Um, and so I ended up getting like four of them as I scaled. Okay. Because that, you know, I wanted more couches and I was probably paying like, I don't know, 200 bucks a month yep. for, a, for a 10 by 30 in Vegas. But this was like <laughs> 10 years ago. I, I, I have no idea what they go for today. Probably double. At least. Yeah. Um, but I never saw a, a 20 by 50. Like me even visualizing that, I'm like, that's huge. Yeah. So like, do you not have any other things? Are they all 20 by 50? So I self storage space is what you're talking about. Yeah. And, and self storage, like you go to the little gate and you get in there and you like shuffle your stuff off. Um, the tenant quality is probably a little lower. Yep. You know, storage wars. Yep. Going on. And uh, so with this, you get a little bit higher clientele, maybe a contractor that doesn't need quite a shop, but he needs just a place to store stuff. Or maybe it's a guy that owns cars. Maybe it's a guy that just wanted his own spot. You know, so we get a little bit higher tenant base, uh, right. quality of tenant, I should say. Yeah. And man, they rent them up. Like as housing gets more and more unaffordable, you get less and less square footage on your lot. Yeah. Everyone dies for a thousand square foot space for 500 bucks. Oh, it's, dude. it's got heat, lights. It's nothing. An outlet, like everything you need. And it doesn't cost all that much. So it works really, really good. I think even in well, high rent areas. I see why people want it. Yeah. To me, that's obvious. And even like with the couch flipping, um, I remember like you brought up like lights and heat and all this. Like we didn't have heat. Um, there was a light. There was one light and there was no outlet. We actually had to like jerry rig an outlet up to the light. I don't even know how we did it. But, <laughs> bought a cord or something? Yeah. Well, I bought a cord and then like there was no outlet for the cord. Like we had to create one through the light. We basically like stole power from the light. Okay. To create an outlet. To create an outlet. Yeah. Creative. Uh, hey, creative. I didn't do it. <laughs> I, w I always was like a who not how guy even before it was a book. I was like, <laughs> there's got to be a way to get power in here. <laughs> for, sure, for sure. Yeah. And then one of my guys, actually it was my dad. My dad's like, oh yeah, we would just do this. And I was like, I don't know what you're saying, but let's do it. That's awesome. But you have, I, like, I mean, your place is legit. I mean, because North Dakota, it's cold. So you, yeah. Like, are they insulated and stuff? Yeah, it's insulated. It's it's almost, it's basically a big flat floor. Can't have floor drains. Doesn't need any utilities, which is kind of nice because they're cheaper to build. Yeah. But they insure much cheaper. It kind of rides that gray area between uh -huh. contractor shop and storage. And when you are when you go to like, say you bought a lot in, in Vegas here and you're looking to put these on there, you know, there's zoning laws, entitlements and things. Well, storage is really adaptable. Mm -hmm. It's very easy. You do contractor shops, they think you're, you're going to make bombs in there. You know what I mean? Like, really? Like, well, it's just like there's more regulation to it. Right. So storage, it's pretty relaxed. You can put these up. You can rent them out easily online, less management, and a higher quality tenant because you're not building self-storage. You're not renting out $49 units. So No, but like, I mean, I know it's called self-storage, but like, 
this is still self storage, right? It is. Like, yep. How are you? But I mean, from the sound of it, people are not using it as self storage. People are using it multi use. Yeah, yeah, mini shop. I mean, I would say yeah. they they get a garage door opener. They get a little keypad. You know, it's a twelve. They by got friends in there. Yeah, pro probably. You know, we put a fifteen amp outlet in there, so hopefully they can't like pull their semi in and live in there, or their RV or something. <laughs> <laughs> There's not, we we're kind of worried about that. Um, that'd but, be that'd be so funny, dude. Just like <laughs> pull the camper in there and just chilling. Uh, you kind of got to put your blinders on when I'm buying these, but we're man, we're doing another facility in Fargo. We're doing a forty thousand square foot facility. Um, Tell me, like, what does the numbers look like on that? Yeah, so um, so the one in Fargo that we're doing, it's a brand new one. It's about a four to five million, four and a half, we'll say four and a half million dollar build. Um, How much is the land? So uh, so the, la the land in Fargo is expensive. Well, compared to Grand Forks, like, I'm probably going to hear I think it. compared to, like, US, like, there's some expensive areas in Fargo, like $30, $30 a foot. Okay. And um, So, like, what's that an acre? Oh, so, gosh. Like, yeah, yeah, I mean, do the math. That's a one point two million, um, something really? like that. Yeah. So we bought. We bought. So a, like, how much did you buy the land for? Yeah, it's a two and a half acre lot. We could fit forty thousand square feet of storage on there. We bought it for like seven hundred, eight hundred thousand, something like 800 that. Eight hundred for eight hundred yeah. for two and a half acres. Okay. But the nice thing in development, like we bought this a little while ago. I'm just ten thirty one ing into it and buying uh -huh. it. Um, but we already got an uptick on the land, like. The nice thing when you're in the development space, you kind of sell the land to the development. Yeah. You get a couple bucks a foot. Yeah. So you unlock some more equity there. Okay. Um, and then- Because you'll buy the land as you mark, and then you'll have investors on the development side, and you'll be like, hey, you know, we're going to use this land. This is fair market for it. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. And so get an uptick on the land and, and build into the development. So then you have, you got some equity to start already. Right. You know, that's that's kind of the whole thing in development. Right now, especially with six percent interest rates or plus. Yeah. You know, it's like you have if you can get a deal to work right now, you you almost can't find a lot of equity. Cause as you know, in an appreciating market, you can't guarantee anyone cash flow. Like yeah. it's yeah. not it just doesn't work. It's a tax break. Yeah, it's a <laughs> it's tax break and you're just, you know, you're betting on it for the next five to ten years. Right. And so in the storage space, like Fargo, really good market. In North Dakota, and people can understand that. And even if the cash flow is a little light right away, yeah, um, they get it. It's easy to wrap your hands around a storage facility. And honestly, most of the social media does the selling for me because everyone's talking about storage. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like so. Your your current one is how big? Um, I have about almost a hundred thousand square feet. No, hundred thousand square feet of this luxury product in Grand Forks. In Grand Forks, and that's. Like, how long does it take to even build one? Because it's storage ain't rocket science. No, as simple as possible, man. Um, you can build them in a few months. You can have, you can have forty thousand feet up. That's you can crazy. be leasing up. Yeah. So, like, our facility in Fargo, we'll have plans. And like, some, some, hopefully July when we have summer in North Dakota. Uh huh. Yeah, <laughs> I know. We we get it up and get it full by that fall. So. So you'll buy land. How long does the permitting take? Two weeks. I, I, a month. We'll just say. So you buy land, you already know it, it, it's zoned for storage. Yep. Working on that right now, even before the purchase. Yeah. Or you're trying to get a zone change. Yep. And then it takes a couple of months to go build 40,000 square feet, which is how many bays? It's like 45 bays. Or, oh yeah. There are a thousand square feet. Yeah. Yep. So 40. A little less. Yeah. 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 40, 40 bays. So. Okay. And it's just cookie cutter. There's no other bay. It's just, everyone has the same. Yep. It, Keep well, it simple. There's a there's like some are like 45 by got it. 18. So it just depends on the layout. We have a couple different models there, but very very much similar large bay. Yeah. High quality. There's no tenant. like 200 square footers. No. Yeah. No. Nope. That's where you go to the self storage and that's just not what we do. It's not where we're set up, not the man we don't have the management in place for I mean, that I, type of setup. I guess I'm sure you've run the numbers. So I'm curious how would it play out differently for that same 40,000 square feet, but chopped up smaller? I mean, I know that there's way more work yep. and I know you're going to get a lower quality tenant and there's way more management now that you have so many more units. But I'm just curious, like how much revenue, if any, do you lose by going the more simple way? Yeah. So having a self-storage facility, I mean, you got to be fenced, gated, <laughs> There's, there's requirements by the city when you're considered self-storage. So that's why oh, so luxury you're, storage, you're at the gray area. So you're not even gated or anything. No, I'm, I'm security cameraed up. 
to the nines. Is but there like a, not not like a clubhouse, but like a front desk thing? Don't nope. need it. It's just everybody's just chilling on their own. Yep, yep. You just have management in place to to check the place out, you know, every day. Got, um, got cameras running everywhere, of course. Um, but yeah, the luxury storage, you kind of move out of the self-storage space of needing all that. And I just think having a quality tenant, but getting back to your thing about why break it up, you know, it's like, I don't know enough about the self-storage space to say I would get into that at this point, you know, and I don't think like there's so much competition in that area. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Like you're attacking, I'm just kind of creating my own niche. It is. And, and what made you do it? Like where, where'd you hear it from? Were you just like, I would want this. Let's do it. Yeah. Well, I was at a, (laughs) I was at a 10 X conference and I'm not typically like really good at conferences, but I sat right behind a guy who was, uh, uh, at the at the conference he was from south dakota so it's course like yeah it's pretty much like neighbors yep, yep. <laughs> where we live i spent a lot of time in um sioux falls okay so he sioux lived in City. mitchell yeah. this guy lived in mitchell okay uh just west of there sioux falls is a great town too a lot like sioux fargo. falls is a good town yeah yeah that, sioux falls and fargo are like sister towns yeah like they're the same yeah and so i met this guy and he's he owns oh a couple hundred thousand square feet of storage in mitchell okay and this would be like the Grand Forks of Sioux Falls, like about an hour west. Okay. And uh, he just said, hey, man, I'm I'm renting these out like crazy. And it's like, so then we hit it off. He's one of my good friends today. And we might be doing another deal in Mitchell. Okay. Um, this just heated storage. So so he like gave you the idea. You went and checked it out probably. Yeah. And yeah. You were like, all right. Yeah. And I got a construction company. I can build this thing. Yeah. Well, I got to be friends. This guy's like, he's like Donald Trump lover all through the other. But he's like, <laughs> the best thing about Donald Trump is that I share a birthday with him. I was like, no, no way. He's like, it's June 14th. It's flag day. It's my birthday. Really? Yeah. So it was like, we hit it off and <laughs> you, this guy and Donald Trump. Yeah. We're, we're, June 14th flag day. Yeah. At, did Donald Trump, well, has it always been flag day or Donald Trump made it flag day? Um, you know what? He might've done that. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. If he's like, this day is flag day. It's for only the true Patriots. <laughs> Dude, he's a salesman. He is. He's, he made it. Yeah. So, so this we hit it off with this guy and he just, he just kind of talked to me about the self storage. That's man, this guy, it's all his family does is do storage in Mitchell. They're the biggest yeah. around in Mitchell and they do a really good job with it. So it was like inspiring he hasn't for like me. cannibalized himself out there. Like there's that much demand in Mitchell. South Dakota is another big one. That's it's investor friendly. So you got California money just come like, like Kevin O'Leary's up in North Dakota. You got a lot of Californians, a lot of people pumping money in South Dakota. Mm. Um, so it's, it's interesting because you get cash flow. Well, what can't you find in an appreciating market? And then this is probably a little contradicting to what you say. Okay. I'm, I'm open to hear it. What can't I find? Cash flow, really. Can't find cash flow. So yeah. then you, what do you get in? You get into debt coverage ratio trouble. Yep. You can't, you can't yep. make the deal work. Yep. You know what I mean? Unless you go have zero leverage. Yep. Um, so up there, you can still get things to work because you got enough cash flow to support the bad times. Right. And the, where you can get developments done up there not just always forcing appreciation, but we get cash flow during the lean times. Got it. To to maintain. So that's what California, they diversify into the Midwest. You own apartments in Iowa. Yep. Yep. And those probably cash flow. Yeah. Those are cash flowing well. So, So, I mean, like, look, as much as I hate on cash flow markets, I think that in the commercial space, it's different, right? That's why we buy these multifamilies and all this stuff. My main beef is when people want to buy these $50,000 single families. Yeah. And I'm like, guys, that ain't it. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, yeah. Don't. I've bought them. Trust me. They're they're a headache. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But when you buy a big deal, it's different. Well, it's just quality of tenant. It's probably not there. He lives in the Midwest. He might make 18, 15 bucks an hour, you know, that you're tenant. Yeah. And then when he has problems, which they're going to have problems, yep. suddenly you're the... <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're the one holding the bag. Yeah. So so with these um, luxury storage units, I'm like I'm just thinking through this, like because like North Dakota seem just from what I know, I know a lot about North Dakota. Um, it's very working class and blue collar um, and everything else. So it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense to me why those storage units are in demand. Yep. And then I'm thinking like, would they be in demand in California? Would like they? You know, I'm in Vegas. I'm like, hey, bro, like, well, freaking, let's build these things. What are we doing? Um, and I'm thinking, would they be in demand in Vegas? What do you think? I don't know the perfect answer to that. Yeah. So I don't want to answer it correctly. But 
are lots getting smaller? Like a million dollar home here, how big is the lot? Is there room for anything else but a two stall, three stall garage? No, no. Lots in Vegas are small. Our like on a a, a million dollar home, the lot might be like seven thousand square feet in a nice area. Wow. So yeah. so you have no room to put anything. No. Like if you went and bought like two cars today, like where are they going? Well, Mark. I'm not most people, okay? I have a six-car garage. You have a six-car, okay. okay. <laughs> but but I did just take up two of my spots um, with a golf simulator. So yeah, oh. if I did buy two cars, I wouldn't have room. Okay, yeah. okay, gotcha. So I'm, <laughs> well, well, let's talk about most people then. <laughs> because Ryan's not most people. Yeah. And I I, I should have got that because you just moved into a new house. Yep, yep. Um, we'll have to check that but out But I was day. a peasant and I had a three-car garage before. So yeah. so what happens then? Like you own that, but you were like, you weren't into new homes and you're just like, you know what? I'm just complacent. I'm, I'm good with this home. Well, I just wouldn't buy a car. Like I just, okay. I'm good having one car. Okay. You know, I, I, I'm actually like the anti um, self-storage customer because like whatever my space has, that's all we get. Oh. And so my clothes... My, my office will tell you, like, my closet is what it is, and I still buy new clothes. So every month, I just throw a bunch of clothes on the table, and I'm like, whoever wants them, wants them. And, like, they're nice clothes. And so, like, everybody's <laughs> fighting for them. Um, Mindy, my wife, who's, like, way more into fashion than me and has, like, way more expensive clothes than me, just did it, like, a couple of weeks ago. The girls oh, went gosh. nuts. They were just, like... It was like Christmas. But anyways, long story short, I wouldn't like ever store anything because okay. I would just get rid of crap. Got it. Yeah. So do you think anyone might... There but has there's to lots be a, of people... My parents, on the other hand, okay. are hoarders. So <laughs> they are the opposite of me. You keep it all. Oh, dude, they will not get rid of anything. I bought them a house and there's a detached two-car garage, like super tall ceilings and like wide. And it was great. And I'm like, guys please don't fill it up. Like, yeah, just get like, let's, let's, we have a reset. This is a new house. And then like within six months, dude, it was just like packed to the brim and stuff. Not, not only just that filled up, but you know, things outside of it and just like, I'm like, <laughs> oh, geez. it is what it is. But yeah, so there you're, there you're definitely, yeah. if they had another thousand square feet. Oh man. Yeah. So not a good comparison for you then. <laughs> uh, I'm a purger too. Yeah. I, I, you know, we have a big, 30 by 50 back building with a golf simulator upstairs. Like I built my dream shop. Like, mm. um, I got cars on lifts and that's, that's what I like. But if I didn't have space, if you had a space where you could go, that was like, it was a decent complex, really nice by your house. It was a bigger 20 by 50 unit. Yeah. Had your own garage door opener. Dude, you for, know? Yeah. For 700 bucks a month. Right. Would yeah, you do it? Nothing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So it's a, that, that's kind of like who we're trying to appeal to. Yeah. It would be tight to have like that, as like a man cave um imagine like you know it's a thousand square feet i go put my golf simulator got a couch a tv yeah like a freaking playing card table do people do that we, we just left the storage space and just like went to ryan's garage yeah <laughs> that <laughs> no, would be tight yeah I don't, I don't know if you'd do that in a storage unit or we might have to re you know hey i'm just saying but, like but at, that's at 700 for sure. bucks a month you you go have like the bootleggers just den yeah Dude, in Fargo, they got they got like areas just where people just buy these like they look like custom homes, but they're just businesses, and they're just like party shacks. Wait, they're custom home businesses. They're, they're they look like custom homes, dang near like they're fancy, smaller uh -huh. like three thousand square foot office buildings. Okay, really fancy, but they're just like party huts. Like really, yeah, just some of the businesses in town own them. Oh, that's interesting. And you want to get in here because then you just kind of network and oh. and and go around. But what what part of Fargo? Um. Like Veterans um, and 32nd, which are two of the main roads, okay. uh, newer roads in Fargo. So interesting. it's interesting. When you come up there again, yeah, um, should be soon. Yeah, probably. If, if they want to give me another contract and I'll go for a day, then there we go. Do it. There we go. But yeah, man, the luxury storage space is a, is a good niche. I, I don't know how it would work in this market, but colder climates work really well because of the heat. Yeah, I just think like your traditional like working class community would love it yeah um but i am curious because one thing that it has going for it that's really cool is you know it's with my friend aj osborne he owns dude, i think he owns two million square feet of storage yep and he does self-storage i don't know like 
the the mix and the breakup of it. So I'm really I'm gonna pick his brain after this. I'm gonna ask him what he thinks of this. But basically, one of the things he does is, you know, in every market when he's looking at buying a building or building one, he's always looking at, um, you know, the competition, right? And he's like, can this area support more storage or not? Because like, you don't want to oversupply right. the market. And I'm just thinking like, okay, you know, you're thinking about that with self storage, but this is unique. No one has it. So like, you're, you're basically never going to have competition. <laughs> right. Well, I'm not saying people don't have it. There's larger storage units out there. Like yeah. you can put your RV and stuff in there. But well, like out here in the RVs, it's just like outdoor. Yeah. They're not enclosed. It's yeah. nothing. And it's still probably in a gated deal that like you can't get to. And, and in yeah. certain markets, you probably have to do gates. I mean, I'd imagine. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, AJ Osborne, Nick Huber, I seen actually did, do you know, I Cody know. Sanchez, I think, um, I don't know if they, they do business together in the storage because Cody okay. Sanchez loves the boring stuff, Yep. Um, which is storage. Yep. And um, I see Nick Huber just put in some. I think he's very similar to about a couple million square feet as AJ Osborne does. Okay, cool. Uh, but more self-storage. Yeah. I'm definitely going to ask him after this because I'm, I'm super curious. If you figure out a development, let me put one together. Yeah. I'll give you the numbers on it. Yeah, if it, if it um, pencils out here in Vegas, I mean, there's so much land out here that I could easily like find the land. Right. And it's such a unique product that I'm just like, yeah, I mean, at those rates, people will buy them. Right. You know, or they will rent them. Like, that's not even a question. Right. Because, you know, uh, thousand square feet or 300 square feet, you know, like <laughs> it's for just a little bit more. Right. And you can go to parts of Vegas where, you know, you can get cheaper land, like similar to what you paid in North Dakota. Seven buck land. Yeah. And then it, dude, if you can, it's such an easy place to park money. Yeah. You know, it's not like you're going to get rich quick, but you, if you can park some money there and park some investor money there, yeah, it does well. It performs. It's easy to manage. You avoid a lot of like evictions and, and process of that. Yeah. Not saying you'll never have that, but you, you reduce compared to multifamily. Well, you just have less units too. So you're not even yeah. dealing with as many potential evictions. Right. So I, that's why I like that storage space. I think it's a good niche. And uh, so, I do multifamily as well, man. So it's... Are you are you building multifam? Yeah. So we're working on... It's, right now, it's it's all about... It's hard to get developments to go because of interest rates. Right. But back at home, we can get some cash flow still. So we're still hitting some DSCR requirements. type requirements that we need to get funding for our projects. But reducing loan to values to reasonable amounts, 65 yeah. And we can get these townhome models because housing, affordable housing is just like disappeared. Yeah. Like, I know. Dude, the college kids coming out of school right now, like getting plummeted. <laughs> okay. All the inflation happening, like these investors, th these kids just are never going to be able to afford a home. I don't know how it gets better for them. They got to become an entrepreneur. <laughs> That's, for real. Yeah. That's it. I, I just don't, I don't understand. I feel bad. I almost sound old saying yeah. that, but like, I feel bad because I hire kids in my construction company and 23 years old, 24 years old, and like got to live in one of these apartments I have just to, and can hardly make rent. Only, you know, it's like, yeah. it sucks, but. It's um, crazy. Yeah. I f and, you know, that's why, like, even for me, I'm just like, how do I help people develop high paying skills? Like, you can flip, you can wholesale, create content, do yeah. Airbnb, go find deals. Like, there's so many ways to make money. And even if you're working a job right now, you can still do this on the side. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, if you're looking to grow your real estate investing business, whether you're just getting started trying to get your first deal or you're trying to scale and get to the next level, you need to join us at Wealthy Investor. We've got events every single quarter that are absolutely crazy. We've got online coaching programs where we have Zoom calls, a community every single week. We give you everything you need to know to start your business, scripts, processes, SOPs, all of it it's for you so that you can dominate. So if you want to learn more about how to join our community and be mentored by me and some of our top coaches and be around other students who are absolutely crushing it, go to wealthyinvestor.com, apply for a free call with my team. Once again, wealthyinvestor.com, apply for a call today. When did you find out you were an entrepreneur? Um, I didn't know I was an entrepreneur. I was forced into it because I was broke, <laughs> but I wanted to play baseball. And so I, I literally, I couldn't get a job. It was just like, who's going to let me go leave to play baseball for six months and then come back and still have a job. Like it doesn't exist. So I was 
basically forced into of like, I'm just gonna have to figure out how to make money myself. Right. Yeah. I was, I was doing the same thing. I was going to school. Uh, I met my fiance after softball, not quite your level of baseball, but <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. And, uh, we bought a house together. Um, since I put a ring on her finger, I, I decided that, and we bought a house where we needed some money to close and, and somehow we qualified at a full-time job while I was going to school. And uh, I got the down payment. I, I sold her car and then we went and leased a car and I pulled the cash out of her car. That's funny. Um, I thank her parents every day uh, <laughs> for that. Um, but then they in 08 or 09, they were giving away that $8,000 check. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. And I, I don't know if you got in on that or flipped a home with that or. No, I mean, I was uh, 21 in 2010. Um, okay. So I had just gotten drafted, but I also got my real estate license. So, I mean, I didn't ha- I couldn't qualify for anything, but, um, I remember as a realtor pitching that and I'm like, Hey, they got this like $8,000 tax credit. You know, Obama's got it here. If you know, you guys want to buy your first house. Yeah. 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 And, and it was awesome. I, I, I got that check. It was like the most money I've ever had. We had $6,500 from this Oldsmobile Alero. <laughs> <laughs> we got a brand new Toyota in the driveway, just closed on a brand new house. I asked for all the closing costs because it was, the, the economy was in tough shape. Yeah. Yeah. You can so, get whatever you want. Yeah. Total I got in the house market. for like 500 bucks, Yeah, you know, because I didn't have to bring anything to close in. I had 6,500 bucks on the car at eight grand. I had 14, 15 grand in my checking. I was like, my gosh, I made it. Yeah. And then, and then I started realizing like I was driving to Fargo to school from Grand Forks. You were going to NDSU? Yeah, well, yeah. For construction management. And then I just didn't fall in love with that. I just didn't fall in love with construction management. It's not what I wanted to do. I, I thought it was because that's what I did growing up with yeah. my dad. But I freaking, I, I, I told her they kind of pissed me off. So I just said, I'm done. I'm out. I'm, I'm, I left my job. We just closed on this house. My fiance is like, let's call my fiance. She's like, I'm like, I, I'm done. <laughs> I quit my job. I don't think I'm going back to school either. <laughs> like, like I'm just done with it all. And she's like, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> so there's my entrepreneurship. Like I, Wait, I, so you I didn't have a thing you were going to do. You were just like, I just don't want to do this. That's all I know. <laughs> I worked for my dad growing up. And, and what'd your dad do? We, we butt heads construction and concrete. So you grew up in the game. Yeah, man. I, and, and that's what I knew. And that's honestly, I knew it really well. So I love doing it. Yeah. Um, and so by doing, by doing that, I was, uh, my dad, I remember my dad coming over. He's like, cause he was kind of like on his way out of construction at that point. Yeah. And I was on my way in, I should have bought him out, but he just like was too, too stubborn yeah. to like me take it over for some reason, whatever. Right. So he comes over and when, and when we, you know, he's like, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> and yeah. then, uh, I don't know. I wasn't going to come back to work for him. So he got upset. Mm. You yeah. Know? You should have so, just bought him out. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and, and I just said, Hey, I'm, I'm going to, I went and installed a fart fan for somebody. <laughs> One of those little fans in your, yeah, yeah, in the yeah. bathroom, they didn't have it. And I was like, I'm going to install it. I made 200 bucks that day. I'm like, geez, I'm onto something. Yeah. Got 200 bucks in my pocket. One day worth of work. I was like, that was pretty good for a college kid. I felt which drop out, uh, 12 credits away too, by the way. So that wasn't too smart, but mm. it worked out. And yeah. I don't and, think your degree is going to matter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have then, a degree. Yeah, I know. And then I, I use it. Not. <laughs> <laughs> I like the entrepreneurship game. It's uh, yeah. I'm a risk taker a little bit. You, you have to be. You know, what's funny is my last year in college. So I was in the same boat. I had, I'd gone to college for three years, but I got three and a half semesters done. So I only had one semester left and, um, I went to UNLV for a semester that, and really I didn't go to UNLV to, to get a degree. I, I went there to meet my wife. We met during that one semester. So really, that, you, know, you were there to meet a girl. No, I was there for my degree. Oh, okay. I ended up with a wife and a degree, <laughs> gotcha. even though the degree is let, I don't use the degree today. I, I don't use my wife either. Okay. So <laughs> either way, I guess I, I don't use anything. Yeah. So um, I forgot what it was. Oh, so the last, the last semester I was there, um, you know, I signed up for all these classes. One was canoeing where I met my wife yeah. and then the other was entrepreneurship. And so, I mean, I was 22 years old taking this entrepreneurship class. And I remember like, and like people talking about it. And honestly, I, and this is like how dumb I was. I didn't even really know what that meant. I was just like, cause like being an entrepreneur wasn't cool. There was no shark tank. There wasn't like any of the things you see. There's no YouTuber guys like me talking about it. Yeah. And so like, I just took, I'm like entrepreneurship. Like that's where you own a business. I think like whatever, <laughs> like I might own a business one day and like 
they, they teach you how to write a business plan and like make a fake business and like, I'm interested in this. I've never like, been, in, I've, I've seen the class, but yeah. And like, it was, it was like my senior level class. And like, I think I got like a C and <laughs> <laughs> you got to see an entrepreneurship. Yeah, and What's your next reel? That, that is a good reel. I forgot that I did that now uh, until I'm talking about it, but yeah, I got like a C in entrepreneurship and I was like, whatever, dude, I'm going to play baseball. It doesn't really matter, but that, was, that, yeah, because you were playing on baseball. I yeah. mean, your passion was there. Yeah. So you asked how I became an entrepreneur. Well, you know, first off, I got an entrepreneur credit. So that was that was the first start. I learned everything I know yeah. from my entrepreneurship class. And then here we are. That, <laughs> there's no people way. Get, you, people get entrepreneurship degrees, I think, too. I have heard of this, like in Boston or <laughs> Northeast or something. Like. It's like, how do you need to go to school to get an entrepreneurship degree? Like, that's the opposite of going to school. You're procrastinating <laughs> on your entrepreneurship career. Yeah, by, <laughs> like, going to, by going in debt to go into school. Like, go get a loan and start a business. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have nothing to lose when you leave college or, you know what I mean? Like, that's yeah. the way I saw it when I had 14 grand in my pocket. I was like, I'm not going to lose this. And, yeah. and that's the way I thought it was like, man, I'm all in, yeah. I'm going on my own. I'm going big time. And then I actually kind of went in like by mistake and just feelers. And yeah. like when I started and we did 250 grand my first year, I'm like, geez, I think in know, the construction company. Yeah. What'd you net from that? I probably made 50 grand, you know, yeah. worked 400 hours a, <laughs> yeah. you know, a day. It was just like figuring it out. You yeah, were doing all the work too. Yeah. Bidding at night, you know, and, and I was doing all the work. I knew concrete, like that was my passion. Like when I do concrete work, it's like, yeah, when you're finishing concrete and I know you've probably never been there, but <laughs> <laughs> what a diss, but you're right. I've watched concrete dry. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've etched my stuff into concrete. So, so all the concrete guys that listen to you will probably yeah. adapt to this, but like, it puts me in pure focus. Like time just goes by. I don't even know what's happening on my phone. I don't know what's happening in my surroundings. Yep. I am purely focused on that. And I think that's kind of what built me to today. Like I get really focused on something and I, I just, I want it perfect. Right. And, and I kind of move to the next level. So I always kind of come back my concrete dries. Right. And like you, that creates your urgency mm -hmm. in entrepreneurship. And then, um, in construction, you really don't, it's not, it's cutthroat. Yeah. It's, you know, unlike the couch flipping career. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Concrete or construction is cutthroat. It's it's cutthroat. So you have to be efficient, right? Like I remember yeah. my dad, he would burn, like he would try to order concrete to a wheelbarrow. Uh -huh. You know, there's like 60 wheelbarrows in a concrete truck. So it's yeah. like, he's trying to, because if he wasted 10 wheelbarrows, that would be all the labor for the day. Like right. that's how he thought of it. So that's what like drove my entrepreneurship. So I was like, that's kind of who he, bred me to be and and my concrete skills honestly adapt to how i do business today mm. do you it, still do any concrete work <laughs> no i i, <laughs> I i'm using my 20 percent that creates 80 percent now okay, so yeah that's i thought maybe you did it for fun i mean yeah. you, you seem like you like it <laughs> i yeah so we do a thing at work where one of the one of the guys one of the foremen i switch spots with them for a day okay and they when's this like actually they day? don't switch spots they just get the day off which mm -hmm. isn't fair i think they they yeah. should completely do my job yeah. Well, um, the company might be gone. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's probably better they just take a day off. Yeah. So I just go out in the forum and I just go in the field. Uh -huh. um, great marketing deal now that I realize that, but it's. Well, it's good for your content too. I get. Yeah. Yeah. And I just get to lead a concrete crew and, and pour some concrete. And so the one day I did it this year, it rained like four times that day. It's like. Oh. And in, in concrete world, you're like, it's just miserable because you got to refinish it all, rebroom it. You do all the stuff. Can that, you even work in the rain, like with concrete? Yeah, no? poly and it's a nightmare. Yeah. And let's just say concrete in North Dakota is a nightmare. You have oh, to keep you it know warm. What? I remember that now. I remember in North Dakota, all the streets being jacked up all the time. Right. Oh, God. Yeah. Because just like the, the snow gets in and then it expands and it breaks the asphalt and all that crap. Right. It freeze thaw. I yeah. mean, it's terrible in concrete. So it's well, you guys don't even really like use asphalt. It's just like concrete everywhere. Yeah, Grand Forks is like the most concrete per capita in the nation. Yeah, I remember that now. Like, I'm, I'm like, wait, are we on a concrete road right now? What's going on here? <laughs> Everything's concrete. Yeah, it's just because no, the durability of it over asphalt. Asphalt just goes in a couple of few years around right. there. Just it can't take the abuse. So it's a lot of built-in work. Asphalt's just a lot cheaper, I assume. That's why everyone uses it. Yeah, it's a lot cheaper, but to get to the grade for it to last a little bit, they have to build it so thick or yeah. build the base so thick where it's almost easier to do concrete. 
well, so why wouldn't we just do concrete here in Vegas? Like, why do we do asphalt? Well, because you're, you're on stable ground. We okay. have expansive soils that freeze four or five feet down. Oh. And so things freeze thaw, the top peels, peels off, and it's just hard on asphalt. Got um, it. You got to paint it black. So, um, but yeah, it, it's built in work though. Like uh, my work's always repeating yeah. <laughs> the concrete I poured 10 years ago is it's, it's always going to need to get reported. <laughs> right. It's never going to last. Yep. So, um, that's uh, funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so why as a construction guy, have you like, I mean, the way that we connected first was you wanted to get on social media, right? You're yeah. like, Yo, I want to build my brand and raise capital and all these things. And yep. like most construction guys are anti that. <laughs> You know, they're yeah. like, dude, I'm freaking, what is this? What is social media? Yeah. Like all I know is swinging the hammer. <laughs> In North, yeah. North, from North Dakota, I, I, I stick out like a sore thumb because I'm doing it all. It's easy to get attention there. Yeah. Because no one else is doing it. It's not yeah. as competitive. Right. Up there. And uh, kind of like you do in Vegas, everyone knows yeah. you because you're, yeah. you're doing it to an extreme level. Yeah. In North Dakota terms. So with, with social media, I just, I want to grow my construction company. I want to be the best. I yeah. want to do the most work. I want everyone to know me because if, as long as they're talking about me, I got, you know, visibility almost beats ability these days, right? Like that's what Omar that's always says. Saying. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't take credit for it. Or Omar <laughs> always says. Oh, he says, just did the wealthy creator call today. I, I wasn't on. I was on an airplane. He headed here, but yeah, yeah I always love listening to him because I'm trying to get better at long form. And yeah, I, I get a lot. In 2022, I failed epically with social media okay. because I, I didn't have all the right things delegated. I didn't view social media as a job. I just did it when it was convenient. Yeah. You're like, I know I need to do it, but whatever. Right. And so sometimes I, I and that's why I got attention to Wealthy Creator and, and your brand because I did some mentorship with like Grant Cardone and like kind of got intermingled in that. Um, he's just in a different level or a different space. He wasn't yeah. doing social media. Like he wasn't telling people how to get attention. He's just saying attention he just brings money. He's good at it. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I doubt why I liked your program is that you were going to teach it. Yeah. You're going to teach it. You're going to teach us how to do the back end. You're going to, you're going to drive us to be better. Yeah. And you're in, I think you're in a space where you're just like, you're trying to teach people that know nothing about social media <laughs> and you're the only one in the space. Yeah. You got a niche there, right? Like it's a blue ocean for sure. And you're in the depths of it. You're doing it yourself every day. You tell people. So like you're living it. And I yeah. love that you're in the trenches of it. Yep. And you're teaching it. Yep. I'm unlike you being a contractor, you know, I'm still in the trenches yeah. with, with the team. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not, doing I wish, it. I wish there was AI Ryan that like could do all this. And then I don't have to be in the trenches anymore. Yeah. Well, you're the face. <laughs> I know. But there, there's going to be AI Ryan one of these days. AI Ryan? Who who like oh, gosh. just sit here. He's just already in the seat and just like having conversations with people. And like it's, he's going to be 80% as good as me. 80% as good as me. <laughs> and you're going to be okay with that. Yeah. And I'm like, that's great. Yeah. So that's why I'm on the podcast now. So hopefully I don't so have to meet AI Ryan. AI Ryan. <laughs> but... <laughs> I mean, how has it uh, affected you? So, I mean, because you already had a successful construction business, like, and you're in a small town where everyone already knows you in the small town. So, like, it'd be very easy for somebody in your position to be like, well, social media is not going to impact me that much because I'm already doing well. I'm known locally. I have a local business. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, what gave you the push to do it? Well, I think it's I think it's building trust. When someone sees you, they trust you, right? Like, and, and it seems like it builds a, a sense of credibility, yeah. which which is what I wanted to do. Because in in North Dakota, um, I'm not going to like use the term "good old boys club," but everyone's kind of to themselves. Yeah, everyone kind of creates their own their own revenue and do their own investments, but everything's a secret. Yeah, and I don't know why you know if it's like that here, but like I talk to my like kids about money, or I talk to other people about money. I like talking about money. Uh, you know what I mean? We want to make money. I don't know why everything's a big secret. So I'm I'm trying to help those that want to talk about money, but they don't, you know, they want to know what I'm doing and I want to help them show them what I'm doing. Right. So that's kind of what I'm using the social media for. And I want to show them what I'm doing in the investing world because it's not conventional. You know, I use the term unfollow the herd. It's because I, I'm not investing in a 401k. I'm not doing, you know, conventional methods. I'm investing in real estate. I'm trying to pursue an entrepreneur. I'm in a construction company. I'm doing social media as a job in North Dakota. Um, 
I stick out. Yeah. <laughs> I stick yeah. out. What's this so, guy got a camera crew for in North Dakota? He must be the most famous person in the world. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, just all the, and I'm learning. I love working with you because you teach me like the back end. Like we talk about the EA thing and yeah. like, I just, I can't talk about anyone else there because they don't have those types of problems. Yeah. Um, so it's just like, you got to level up and, and I can see you are obviously a few years ahead of where I want to be. And that's mm-hmm. why I, you know, I like where your space is and I like your programs. I appreciate that, bro. Yeah. That we're, we're going to chop that up into some good content to say, go to wealthycreator.io. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. You're in. Yep. Um, but I mean like also too, right? I mean, it, it will help your local business. You're going to inspire a lot of people. Um, but I think like you're, you're going to, I, th- I believe you're going to do a lot of these self storage projects and you're going to raise capital to do it. So yep. I think that social media is going to help. And, yeah. you know, obviously for anyone watching this, if you guys want to link up with Mark, where would they find you? Yeah. So you'd find me like right now, like my biggest platform, Ryan won't be very proud because it's not video form, but <laughs> LinkedIn is kind of where I put out value within these storage, like the details of them. I bring value. And then I have a newsletter called and follow the herd where if someone just doesn't want conventional methods and work till they're 60 and just hopefully have enough money to retire, follow and follow the herd. It's a newsletter I deliver every Saturday. It's awesome. Okay. A lot of people get value from that. That's cool. So that's that's like my biggest way to follow me, but I'm also on Instagram. I'm working the YouTube. Yep. Um, just follow me at Mark Kuhn. Yeah. Um, I think your YouTube, and we've talked about this before, like, you know, filming these storage units and like doing jobs and construction, like it's all good content, you know, just getting out. I hate it because I don't want to go out in the field and like do the things that... Like I don't go check on my flips. I don't do any of that yeah. stuff, but like I will go do it occasionally for content and everything else. Yeah. I, I, I love it in the field. Obviously I, I grew up in the field. Yeah. I poured concrete. I mean, we could shoot content all day about that. I think way back in the day we were shooting like concrete video how to's. Yeah. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? Or what am I doing here? It's <laughs> yeah. like, don't, don't. Um, but anyway, it's obviously evolved since then. We're but in- so I have, um, a guy, a mentor, and he's got um, a wood shop channel on social media. Okay. Or not wood shop, but like, um, you know, he's a carpenter. He builds tables and, and all those things. And uh, he's got like almost 800,000 on YouTube. Wow. He's been doing it a long time. And so we're working with him on building his back end for that social media because he's got all this attention, but he's not monetizing it the way that he could. Yeah. Right? So um, we're working on that, but he's very successful because he's teaching how to do like, Hey, how to build this table and you know, how to sell it and, you know, create these cool things. Like I've even watched those videos where I'm like watching this guy build this sick table with like this cool gloss on it. And you know, it's, it's entertaining. Yeah. No, I, I, I have a lot of fun doing social media right away. It's like the camera effect, right? Like the camera's on you blanks, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you just get that. And then now I'm having fun with like, providing value because people reach out. They're like, wow, that was really helpful. I kind of want to do this in my own market or whatever. Right. Like, so I'm having a lot of fun with it. We're shooting. We just, you know, bought an apartment today for 5,600 bucks. Yeah. Um, how'd you buy an apartment for 5,600? <laughs> <laughs> What'd you do? That's the hook. Yeah. <laughs> That's there you the go. Hook. Tell me. Um, I think I know the answer, but I want to hear it. Yeah, man. So um, this apartment building went through, I have to, it went through a cycle. I call it the death spiral of like a property. Okay. And so like phase one, they reduce the repairs. It's kind of like the slumlord effect. They reduce all the repairs, cut all expenses, keep the income high, raises the value. Well, what does that do? The lipstick wears off. Then your tenant quality goes down. Yep. Uh, Or you have to reduce rents a little bit to keep it full. Yep. Then the next phase is that you have, um, you have riffraff start. Yep. You have eviction start. Yep. You have, now you have less income. Mm-hmm. Now you got to cut the expenses even more to keep, keep it at the same base. Well, then what happens? The building starts really like wearing down. It's going down in value. You don't have, you can't even meet the DS- DSCR and you can't even fix up the building so the tenants can live there. Mm. So that's what this building, it's called the property death spiral. Okay. I'm going to trademark that. Yeah. Um, but like, that's where this building was at. It was at. Two tenants of 36 units in the building. Two out of 36. Yeah. It was built, built in 94, so it's not like... Dang, it's a, that's new. Yeah, it's not an old building. It just it just wasn't cared for properly, and it's in a good area. And so... And this is where? Uh, in Grand Forks. In Grand Forks, okay. Yeah, where we're 36 at. 36 unit. 
How much did you pay for it? Um, we paid one nine. It appraised for two eight. Nice. It needs about a half million in work. Okay. So um, we'll have two four into it. Well, we got fifty six hundred into it. Yeah. And uh, they've got a seller carry to carry the rest. Uh, so the the seller carried how much? Two fifteen. So how so how was the deal structured? You paid one nine. You got a loan for how much? Two one. Two one. Yeah. Of two eight. Seventy five percent of that. Okay. So you got 70 and that was just like a normal bank. Yep. Conventional. Bank. What about, did you raise private money for anything else? I just needed 5,600 bucks. And then, uh, you, at the end so of the bank was willing to give you all of that. Cause it was such a good deal. Right. Yep. And then they kind of connected a little construction loan. Cause there was a half million dollars of construction in there. So, so, so the bank lent two one, one nine out of the gate, one nine out of the gate. Yep. And then and we got a couple the rest hundred for the construction. Yep. So you just came out of pocket fifty six hundred. Yep. And then the seller carried the other part. Two, two fifteen principal only. Yeah. So we'll after five years we'll when that we got a five eight five loan on it which we felt pretty good a thirty year loan and uh, so what are you gonna do in five years like what do you think it'll be worth? What's the projection? I think the projection was like four. Yeah. So it's like, it's a good deal. I'll probably, you know, in some of these deals, I'll let my investors, I'll come in, stabilize it, do my thing, get it worth two eight. Yeah. And then I'll back some of my money out. Yeah. Um, let investors it. in this yep. and then I'll, I'll go find another deal. We'll yep. go build some more storage. Yeah. That's one thing that as I got into the fun game that I just didn't think about was like a, a thing that people did, but you know, backfilling. Yeah. And so like a lot of deals we've bought, I've personally put up you know, a lot of capital and then, you know, just to get the deal done and yeah. rolling and then, you know, people backfill it along the way. Yeah. And it's, and your investors like it. It's a stabilized property. They, they, uh, your, your, your investor base, it's safe. You took all the risk. Yeah. You put up all the money right out of the gate. Yep. And it's like investors need to understand that. And yeah, and really they don't even know if some of them didn't even know you're just offering to back some of your equity out. Yeah. Um, that's what, uh, it's funny because you know, I had Cardone on here um, a few months ago and like people had accused him of doing something like that. Oh. Um, but like, I don't, I haven't like looked super in depth, but they were basically like, oh, well, he's basically selling it to his fund at like this huge, you know, spread uptick. and yeah. uptick and he's not disclosing it. And I'm like, first off, even if he is doing that, which I don't even know if that's true or not. But even if he was, I can guarantee you it's in the PPM. <laughs> like, it has to be. There's, a, there's no way it's not. Yeah. Like, it's going to be disclosed that I am selling this to myself. <laughs> like, <laughs> Well, I yeah, and I don't know if he backs out all of his money. You know, yeah. different. I'm, I'm, I'm sure he has different methods. But, I mean, that's how he goes and finds new cash and he places it. Yep. You know? And, then, and, you know, he's got his own cash and he'll buy whatever and then backfill and just keep doing it that's all he's doing he's rinsing and repeating yeah i mean and he's able to raise money with his instagram uh, yeah. similar to you you have a big following you have yep. a lot of trust yep he raised i mean it's funny because grant and this is something i've struggled with as i've built more businesses but grant's got a lot of businesses too i mean obviously you've got different businesses now and so i've struggled with promoting just all these different businesses right and grant's just kind of gotten to the point where he's like just give me money at cardone capital and like, he doesn't promote really much else. I mean, he still will talk about 10 X or a workshop or yep. whatever, but he's not like, join my coaching Join Like, he's just like, just give me money, put it in my fund yeah, or one of my properties. And then you can be, that's how you get his attention. Yeah. I was like the, um, yeah. And Grant was, you know, the reason like in the concrete business, I learned, uh, just how to work harder. And the harder you work, the more money, kind of like the more couches you flip, the more money you make. <laughs> right. You know, the problem is you don't keep any money. Right. And I know you're a flipper. Like you, you're, you're used to making revenue cash, yep. you know, yep. and, and probably holding on to properties drive you nuts. Yep. Um, but you know, that's how you generate some wealth. Yeah. You know, uh, it's your brand. So I think my phone heard me talking in like 2018 or some 17 or 18 and like Grant Cardone pops. I was like, who's this guy? Uh -huh. Aggressive. <laughs> like. I don't know, but I like kind of what he's saying and, and you know, you'll always be known by the money you keep and, and I, I don't know, he has all of his sayings, right? Like he's got so many sayings. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> I'm like, does he just sit around and like come up with these sayings and then, you know, just repeats them over and over again? He does. He does. And he has got the same like six stories, but like every time you listen to him, <laughs> like he knows how to speak 
to a crowd. Yeah. No matter the crowd, no matter oh, where he's yeah. at. Hell wing ever. Like, so, I mean, he spent a whole day here, um, last year and, yeah. uh, you know, we were filming for his TV show and stuff and like, you know, obviously him and I were just chatting throughout the day and whatever. And then we had to do a couple of promos, um, for different things, like for the TV show and then the podcast. And then I was at his office for some other stuff and like him and I are both the same where there's no prep. It's just like, all right, you ready? Yep. All right, let's go. And then we just start riffing. And like, even if you, you've seen me on stage many times, like at these workshops and stuff, a lot of it is just freestyle. So you don't have anything prepared for Hollywood next week? <sighs> on some parts I do. On other parts, <laughs> I'm going into it and I'm like, all right, I have a general idea of what I'm going to do. Um, and then no, but other parts, like truthfully, like a lot of our MVP day stuff, um, I will literally go up there. I'll be like, Hey guys, I don't have an agenda. So tell me, what do you guys want to know? Questions. And, yeah. And then they will be like the, the last, like all these things. And then I'll get a feel for the room and you're like, Oh, okay. Everybody wants to know how to create content. Oh, everyone wants to know how to run multiple businesses. Okay, cool. So here's how it is. Like, cause at that point I can just answer. Okay. So I always like to, I like to freestyle because I think it actually it's just like if you're negotiating a deal with the seller, you don't go in and just make an offer. <laughs> you listen like, hey, why do you want to sell? Like, what's important what's to you? What's the problem? Like, how do we solve? Why Why did you come to this event? Like, what are you hoping to learn? Okay, cool. Well, let me give you that. Yep. That's uh, crea creativity. I didn't think I was creative until like all these real estate deals, like even my first house I bought, like yeah. that's all creativity. Like yeah. you think about it. I think you were talking about this maybe a couple of Wealthy Wednesdays ago. Yeah. Um. But like you are creative, yeah. you're very creative. Um, you do a lot of great content on a whim, yeah. Basically, yeah. And um, so I, I, I'm getting better at that. Yeah. Um, I don't think my stories are really intriguing, but you're always harder on yourself than anybody. Well, I, I mean, you've told a lot of great stories today, unknowingly, probably, right? And uh, I think, to your point, like you want to make you know, more money flipping couches, you flip more couches. You want to get better at concrete and make more money, you just pour more concrete, right? Yep. And with content, I always tell everyone at Wealthy Creator, I'm just like, guys, you're going to suck starting out. That's the way it is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If I go try and pour concrete right now, I'm going to suck. Yeah. I have yeah. no idea what I'm doing. Um, but eventually, over time, I'll get reps in and everything else. And then boom, like, you know, there's going to become a point where you're like, wow, like I'm actually pretty good. Yeah. And then it's going to continue to get better the more reps you take. And that was why, um, I mean, every skill I've wanted to learn, and this is a good tip for the audience. Like go all in on learning the one skill at a time. Like I don't just like practice 10 different things and like I'm good. Yeah. It's like I master it. So it's like baseball. All right. I'm devoting my life to that. All right. Cool. Flipping houses. All right. I'm not worried about rentals or development or self-storage. I'm like flipping yeah. houses. That's it. I got to become a master at this. All right. Social media. I'm blocking everything out. I'm just figuring out how to make videos. I'm going to make two TikToks a day. I'm going to edit them myself to like fully learn the process. Um, you know, and golf. Like, hey, I want to get good at golf. Yeah. I got to just practice golf every day. That means I'm not going to be able to do some other things. And But I, I want to learn this skill. So, you know, I think it just comes down to if you want to become great at improvising content and public speaking and everything else, it's like, all right, well, Let's go all in on that. <laughs> let's go. Let's go to Toastmasters and just freestyle and go be put on stage. Have no prep. Oh man! And then see what happens. Have you done that? Oh yeah. Well, I don't go to Toastmasters, but like I go into many things with no prep. The yeah. team will tell you. They'll be like, "Do you know what you're going to talk about?" And it's like we're starting in one minute. And I was like, "What should we talk about?" And I'll just be like messing with them, and they're like, "Uh," and I'm like, "All right, I got 60 seconds. All right, let me think." 60 seconds. All right, here's what we're talking about. <laughs> so what? what is that? You just did the thing. Like, oh, here's what we're talking about. What? Yeah. What? You saw something or you just thought about something? I don't know. It's just like a what skill. clicks. Like it just comes to me. Really? Yeah, I'm just like, all right, this is what we're going to do. Because, I mean, I, I'm just so used to it. Because when I go to film content, um, like if I'm going to go do a bunch of reels, like I go in there with no prep and I'm just like, all right, let me think about this. All right, cool. Boom. All right, cool. And like, so it's training yourself to come up with an idea as fast as possible. Yeah. And, you know, it's just a skill. It's just like, to me, it's no different than uh, 
all the skill I learned in fielding baseballs and throwing them accurately, which I wasn't that great at. But, um, <laughs> you know, you learn to throw them yeah, yeah. somewhat accurately yeah, because you just do it so many times. I don't have to think about like, all right, what do I have to do again? Do I step? And then I step again. Then I raise my arm right here. And then like, I make sure I cock it back a little bit. And then I throw, like, you don't do that. Okay. You just do. Just do it. Um, and you can do it at insane speeds in sports, right? You like learn like, oh man, this ball's coming at me a hundred miles an hour. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't have time. I just right. do. And I think that's how content has become where I can easily like debate or talk with somebody because it's just like the game moves so fast. Well, I guess it's fast, but it's slow. Yeah. <laughs> so you slow it down. Yeah. What's your, your brain just used to thinking so fast. I mean, it's fast just used and to you it. talk slow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just used to it. And I also know how to like stall. Well, bro, it's been a lot of fun hanging out with you, man. Um, I, I think the self storage stuff is great. Hopefully we can do something together with that. Um, super intrigued, but, um, for those who want to find you, I know you're on LinkedIn. Yep. Mark Coon on LinkedIn. Yep. Uh, my Instagram needs some help. So please come follow me on there because I, <laughs> the, the short form is definitely building into my long form YouTube where I'm yeah. educating people in the self storage. I'm educating people how to buy an apartment for 5,600 bucks. Yeah. I'm literally walking them all the way through the process. Um, and I'm, I'm in North Dakota. This yeah. can happen anywhere. So follow me, follow me for some more tips on like how to do real estate development. It's like, yeah. it's not honestly that hard and they can invest with you too. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and if you want to, you can invest right beside us in these storage deals. You don't have to do it, right? Yeah. Like everyone everyone in North Dakota thinks they have to do everything. Yeah. Or in some markets, you have to do everything. You don't. Um, and, and in most cases, real estate is not a passive investment. Yeah. It's constant attention. But there's ways to get all the benefits of real estate and be a passive investor. And that's kind of what we offer at like Mac Capital. And, and a lot of people have liked that because they can be on a beach. I, yeah. send, them, I send them a report. Hey, this is what you made. Yeah. You know, it's like, here's all, we're taking care of it. Yeah. Everything's taken care of. And you still get all the tax benefits, appreciation, yeah. cash flow. I love it, bro. Yeah. Well, guys, go check them out. Make sure you watch the next episode that we're about to play. And I'll see you then. Peace.